Now, there's a bit of a postscript to this to this talk. I'm, I'm going to just read a little bit now from, from what the authors say. Uh, despite advances in modern information technology, the accuracy of data collection has not advanced in the United Kingdom for over 150 years. Quite incredible. And that's based on the work of this gentleman here, Alfred Russell Wallace. Great scientist. The media is always talking about him for being the uh, co-discoverer of the theory of uh, evolution by natural selection with Charles Darwin. Uh, great scientist, naturalist, and uh, a kind of guy I would really like to have had a couple of pints of beer with, I must say. Sadly, he died in 1913. Um, anyway, <clears throat> the, um, the, the, the authors go on to say, because the same problem of erroneous data entry found then are still found now in the COVID pandemic. <clears throat> so the same problems discovered by Alfred, 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 Alfred Russell Wallace in the 1880s and 1890s were still there in the 2020s. Not only in the UK, but all over the world. We have independently discovered the same UK data problem and solution for assessing COVID-19 vaccinations as Alfred Russell Wallace 150 years ago and investigating the consequences of vaccine uh, the vaccine acts starting in 1840 on smallpox. So what Alfred Russell Wallace did after he discovered the theory of evolution by natural selection, <coughs> or basically natural selection survival of the fittest with Charles Darwin, he then went on in later life to study um, the 1840 smallpox uh, vaccination um, act. Um, so <coughs> he went on to do that. And this is all in a really quite interesting uh, book here. I can show you it here. This is it. It's available. Uh, you can look at the whole text. <coughs> it's one of those really cool ones where you can um, turn over the page and read the whole book, uh, thankfully by the, the Wellcome Foundation. So the whole thing is available. And what we find is, and I didn't know about this, I must say, um, that Alfred, Alf Alfred Russell Wallace found the same deficits in data after the smallpox vaccination act of 1840 and later acts in times we'll look at in a minute. Uh, 1853, I think the next one was making it compulsory. The same data problems are still there in the UK that you can't narrow things down. So what, what Wilson cited, he, he said, yeah, I'm going to use the, the Wallace method which is looking at this mega data, looking at the whole thing, which of course in my view is a much better way to do it. So Alfred Russell Wallace is used by Wilson Sy. <laughs> it's very clever what, what Wilson's done here, I must say. Um, so um, Alfred Russell Wallace said this, having thus cleared away the mass of doubtful and erroneous statistics, ringing any bells, depending on comparisons of the vaccinated and unvaccinated in limited areas in selected groups of patients, well, we still don't have that data. It's not released by the UK government. Unless you work for a pharmaceutical company, of course, in case in which case it is released. It's not released to the hoi polloi like you and me, or more importantly, or to our statisticians like Dr. Clare and Professor Fenton, who would love to analyse this data. Uh, Alfred Russell Wallace goes on in his publication of whenever it was, 18, 1880 or something, 1890, something like that. He goes on. Um, do check this out for yourself. It's really good fun. You can just click over the pages. Um, <laughs> um um, we turn to the only really important evidence, those of mass national experience, is what he said. So really quite incredible. Working in the 1880s and 1890s after the 1840 Smallpox Vaccination Act, which provided free smallpox vaccination for the poor. Now, if you don't want to hear this history, then click off at the main part of the video. is done. I just found it so interesting. I just had to go on making some notes on it. Um, so... Free smallpox vaccination was made available to the poor in 1840. In the same act, a variolation was banned. <coughs> so variolation was... Um, in variolation, they actually gave some smallpox pus. They actually gave someone the disease, um, which is a really bad idea. So variolation, variola, smallpox. That was banned, but it was made 
But the smallpox vaccination apparently was made compulsory in 1853 and 1867 acts. I wasn't aware of that. So why was he interested? Why was Alfred, Alfred Russell Wallace interested? Well, in Leicester, there was anti-vaccination demonstrations in 1885. I wasn't aware of that, but it rings bells, doesn't it? There was growing public resistance to compulsory vaccination in 1885. And Wallace had increasing involvement in social reforms and statistical arguments. So his interest in social reform, his skill in statistics, put him in the ideal position. And again, we've got people like that. Professor Fenton would meets both of those criteria. He has the expertise. He, he has the interest in social welfare. Um, why don't the government give him the data? Is an open question. Statistical critique of vaccinations. <clears throat> so government data on smallpox mortality trends before and after compulsory vaccination. This is what he looked at. He looked at mortality trends before and after compulsory smallpox vaccinations. He took into account the case mortality rate. Just like history really repeats itself, doesn't it? Or it rhymes at least. Then he looked at vaccination versus sanitation effects. Because, of course, sanitation then was improving dramatically. So was it that people were being vaccinated or was it because sanitation was being uh, improved? Now, I'm not giving answers to this. I'm not saying it was one or the other because this is still hotly debated today. But he looks at mortality trends before and after each act in 1853 and 1867. And uh, he wrote a paper called 45 Years of uh, Registration Statistics. Provide, proving vaccines to be both useless and dangerous. So 45 years of registration statistics proving vaccination to be both useless and dangerous. Not the case I'm making, I'm simply saying what Alfred Russell Wallace published in 1885. And then this book that we've been looking at here, um, which you can read for yourself. Um, this is um, Vaccination, a Delusion, it's penal enforcement, a crime. Eighteen, published in eighteen ninety eight, and he also made contributions to the Royal Commission on Vaccination in the eighteen uh, from eighteen ninety to eighteen ninety six. So Wallace argued this declining smallpox mortality was due to improved sanitation, not vaccination. In other words. Wallace argued it wasn't the vaccines that were saving people's lives. It was improved living conditions. And this is true today. Very often it's how you live, your diet, your exercise, your lifestyle, what drugs you take, more importantly, what drugs you don't take, like alcohol and tobacco and things that, that, that decide how healthy you're going to be, as opposed to just taking a pill for everything. So... Wallace argued that declining smallpox mortality was due to improved sanitation, not vaccination. That was his argument. Official statistics were misinterpreted or biased, he said. So this is Wallace in the end of the 19th century, 150 years ago, saying official statistics were misinterpreted or biased. And then Wilson Sy saying we still have basically the same problem in the 2020s. Couldn't make it up. Uh, Wallace argued that compulsory vaccination was unjust. He argued that um, revaccination did not reliably prevent outbreaks. With COVID, we know that's true. It wasn't preventing transmission to any extent at all. So he was arguing that vaccination did not reliably prevent outbreaks. Uh, and these views, we should note, are strongly disputed then and now. Wallace had a strong dis di distrust of medical authority. But he did believe in statistical reasoning, social reform, opposition to coercive government measures, and the primacy of environmental and sanitary conditions, and I would add lifestyle conditions, in health. This is a guy who died in 1913. What a guy, eh? Love to have had a pint with him. Fascinating. Always good to learn lessons from history, which doesn't repeat itself, but it sure as heck does rhyme. 
The serious point here is people who lost relatives, especially in those peaks in 2020 and 2021, really can't have closure because they don't know if their relatives died of COVID, which some did, or of midazolam and morphine, which I suspect a lot more did. Now, my understanding is that medical records in the UK are kept for seven years. So time is ticking. So my appeal would be that health authorities and governments anonymise this data, which they can do, they can do, and release it for our statisticians to analyse. Then we can work out if indeed morphine and midazolam caused mass fatalities then we'll know for sure. To me, the evidence is currently very convincing. Read this paper, I think you'll agree. Um, but that data needs to be released. Now, given that we've got our current government in the UK for another three and a half years, um, the worst government of my lifetime, I would say, and that's I'm not even that political, but they're just terrible. Um, and they've refused to release this data. Um I think a lot of these records are going to be no longer available within seven years by the time we have a governmental change. That means a lot of people will never know why their loved ones died. A situation which I consider to be appalling. Bit of a long video today. If you got to the end, well done. Thank you for watching. Just so interesting the way that... Um, Alfred Russell Wallace had the same problems and came to very similar conclusions. I wish I'd known more about his work five years ago. But there you go, we live and learn. At least some people do. Thank you for watching.